Hi, Rick here, and today I'm going to ask a very complex question that is definitely going to take 10 minutes to answer. What is the contents of a starship's shuttle bay? Shuttles? No, 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 wait, come back! So, yes, obviously shuttles, which I will be looking at, but I was also talking about other vessels and the like that a starship would carry. Of course, these vary with the type of Vessel 2. Craft such as the Galaxy class had three shuttle bays, with two in the main hull and one large one at the rear of the saucer section. Something smaller, like an Intrepid, only had a single shuttle bay, and it was a rather conservative one at that. Generally, however, a large starship would have a loadout of four types of small craft, not counting personal vessels or the captain's yacht. We'll start with those craft with the shortest range and the single purpose, the worker bees as they are known. These can come in several varieties and have been part of Starfleet's workforce since practically its inception. These small one-pilot vessels serve purposes from maintenance to cargo transferences and they lack warp drive in most cases, even environmental regulation, often requiring the operator to don an EVA suit inside the cockpit. In the mid-23rd century, these small craft were equipped with manipulation arms which themselves featured numerous tools. These tools were interchangeable and adapted for various small tasks, but could include cutting lasers or plasma torches for slicing into ship hulls or cutting up debris. They were deployed to repair external damage, salvage operations or even to ferry cargo. Basically, small utility craft. By the late 23rd century, around 2268, these had been phased out in favour of the Cargo Management Units CMUs, that were in operation at starbases such as the San Francisco Fleet Yards, before expanding to see regular duty aboard ships. These served the same purpose as the early worker bees, even adopting the name, but originally had a focus on transferring large amounts of cargo via their stronger impulse engines. However, when these vessels were outfitted with manipulator arms too, it would have been apparent that they served equally well in ship maintenance and construction. By 2319, these new craft were part of every new Starship's complement, and soon a regular inclusion aboard Starships in general. Much like their predecessor, their arms could be removed or changed for a variety of other tools. However, for the most part, they lacked an internal atmosphere, allowing the spacesuit-clad pilot to easily enter and exit the capsule to conduct affairs with greater finesse if needed, I guess. Large ships like the Galaxy class often carried around four of these small ships for maintenance. The next craft we see are the shuttle pods. These are defined as non-warp capable that are smaller than shuttles and designed specifically for ferrying people. Usually, two people would crew these craft, but they could hold up to four. These included the Type 15 and the Type 18s, and were used often to travel to and from a planet's surface, star bases, or in between ships. Basically, any time warp was not required. The designation seems to have been carried over from the basic non-warp shuttle pods seen on craft like the pre-Federation NX-01 Enterprise. Moving up in scale from the shuttle pods, we have the shuttles themselves. These were the primary warp-capable subcraft of a starship and made up the majority of the capacity of a shuttle bay. Space stations and the like did maintain a supply of them, but due to their long-range nature, it was actually less common to see them in use around starbases, where shuttle pods and other specialised inspection craft did just fine. There are so many types of shuttles to warrant their own video, but generally they fit into two categories, big and small. Not every shuttle was warp capable, but most are, and as such designed for long-term occupants being able to run independent missions from their mothership. Such craft featured replicators, transporters, and the full range of environmental controls. They also had offensive and defensive capabilities and a wide array of sensors. In essence, everything a starship needed to function, just on a far smaller scale, running off of a mini warp core. So, shuttles were deployed for a variety of reasons, but often as transport to and from the main ship when it was impractical or dangerous for the starship to make the journey itself. We often saw crew utilise a shuttle to visit locations where the Enterprise was unable to deviate from its course, or when transporters were not an option. 
Variations in mission profile of the main ship often dictated what kind of shuttles were loaded aboard. For example, there were specific medical orientated shuttles, survey craft and even experimental ones and ones designed to deploy ground vehicles. Starfleet divided its shuttles into numbered classes. Smaller shuttles, such as the Class II, often made room for a pilot and a co-pilot and were fast, agile and great for quick runs to and from a planet. However, they were not designed for comfort, so long-term usage was possible but unfavourable. Such cramped conditions gave rise to terms like Class II claustrophobia. Slightly larger are models like the Type 6s or 8s. These still had the standard seating for two occupants, but a much roomier interior. These vessels actually featured rather comfortable seating in the rear that could be swapped out for inventory space depending on mission requirements. A Class 6 was given to the time-displaced Captain Scott, and if I had to speculate, I think that these sorts of ships were given out when a mission was expected to take longer than a day or so. These were more numerous aboard larger starships like a Galaxy class, while smaller ships made do with smaller shuttles. See the USS Voyager, which did have a Class 8, but made more use of its numerous Class 2s. Getting larger, we have the Type 7s and 11s. These bigger shuttles were more personal-centric craft made for ferrying multiple people for whatever purpose, often termed administrative. This would likely have been for diplomatic duties. The Type 11, however, was designed to be a large, multi-mission vessel with a high degree of adaptability and manoeuvrability. These vessels saw implementation in the Sovereign-class starships and beyond, likely meaning that their design and function was influenced by the preceding Dominion and Borg threats. Even the shuttles were beefed up. Larger than shuttles is the subclass of shuttle, known as the Runabouts. The first of this classification were seen in the Danube-class runabouts allocated to Deep Space Nine and similar Federation outposts, but large vessels again such as the Galaxy-class would house several within their hangars as they became more common. Space stations often had several of these in their bays, as do outposts. Being practically immobile locations, these larger shuttles were the answer to long-range travel in the area. The runabouts are basically a small starship. They not only feature all the standard systems of a shuttlecraft, but also several amenities, such as more private cabins and mission-specific rooms that could be outfitted with small labs or tech bays. These were designed to run missions completely autonomously for weeks, maybe even months at a time, and as such had to remain comfortable for an extended stay. The downside was that they were often rather slow, but could be modified for increased speed. All of these shuttles, runabouts and worker pods were capable of operating in atmosphere, as well as the depths of space, and several could even be modified to work under greater pressures than a standard M-Class. Alongside the vessels themselves, the Starfleet's shuttle bays had maintenance pits that could open up to allow the repair or modification of their inventory of small craft, and some vessels had industrial replicators that could be used to manufacture entire components to replenish their supply. While the maintenance bays or hangars were found on all vessels large enough to accommodate shuttles, the industrial replicators were less frequent and some vessels would simply have to scrap damaged small craft, then resupply at the next opportunity. Shuttles of any size, from the small Type 15s to full runabouts, could be independently named from their mother ship. Although the Danube class were granted their own independent registry number alongside their name, smaller craft retained the registry number of the starships to which it was assigned, and were simply differentiated by a number. This marks a distinct difference in designation where shuttles were regarded as little more than infantry and runabouts as basically a whole starship, despite serving similar purposes. Shuttle bays on starships had various methods of storing their craft too, with some being held in bays akin to parking lots where the floor space was not a concern, while other ships could retract them into compartments such as beneath the floor or behind walls. Many vessels would retain some empty space, however, for the arrival of visiting craft or any other needed ships that may be encountered, so a starship's capacity for shuttles was often higher than what was being utilised. 
something like a Defiant class. A small vessel, by itself only 170 metres, actually had a special type of compact shuttle called the Type 10, or Chaffee shuttle pod designed for it. These were as utilitarian in design as their mothership, and were less than 10 metres long. The Defiant carried only four, while a Galaxy-class starship carried routinely eight shuttlecraft, eight shuttle pods, four worker bees, and had room for one, maybe several runabouts. This is unlikely to even be its full capacity, as some specs dedicate an entire deck to shuttle storage, which would allow for dozens more. Basically, a rule of thumb is that the larger the vessel, the more shuttles it's going to have, and the larger they'll be. So. There we have it, a breakdown of the standard small craft that you'd find aboard a Federation starship, and the reasons for their variety in design. While the exact loadout would vary from ship to ship and even mission to mission, these are the most common things you'd find down there. Thanks for watching this video on the subject, and I'm currently exploring topics around this sort of thing, so that's why I'm not going into specifics on the shuttle types themselves here. Thanks again. I've been Rick, and until the next video, goodbye.